Uh, anything on behalf of the defendant? No, Your Honor. Mrs. Harper. Judge, is it connected to the just no. Should be blacked out. Sometime. It is blacked out right now. Okay. You want to make sure that it is working, though. Yeah, I can uh, if you're ready. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's working. Okay. Just didn't want to add to our. That's fine. Yeah. Right. Because every time we take a break, it seems to Correct. stop working. Correct. Uh, no matter that we touched nothing. That's technology. All rise for the jury. All right, be seated, ladies and gentlemen. At this time, we will continue with the direct examination of Dr. Daniels. You may inquire. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Dr. Daniels, I'd like to move on to um, the back of Rachel's neck, please. Were there any injuries to the back of her neck? There were none recorded. Okay. Uh, was there... Um... Well, none. Okay. There were no ligature marks recorded. Okay. And we'll get back to that in a minute. Were there any other injuries to the back of her neck? There was one injury to the back of her neck. Would you please explain that for the jury? Um, there was what we call a sharp force injury to the back of the neck. And in fact, it is a stab wound. Okay. Um, and um, if I may, Your Honor. Yes. We have State's Exhibit V13 up there. Uh, can you use your laser pointer and show us what we're talking about? So this is a, a stab wound. And then it, I'm going to, oh, I apologize. I'm going to move ahead to uh, V14. What is that? This is a close-up of the stab wound. And in this case, you can see it has a slight J shape. Okay. And what, if anything, does that slight J shape tell you? Um, that results when a knife blade is inserted or a sharp instrument is inserted into the body and then turned, either being while in or partially withdrawn and turned. It gives that, um, it gives that J shape to the generally one end and usually the blunt end uh, of the stab wound. Um, and were there any corresponding internal injuries for this stab wound? Yes, there were. Can you explain those for the jury, please? Okay, there was a uh, skull fracture on the, in the floor of the skull at the back. The technical term for that area is called the posterior cranial fossa. It was on the left. Um, it's the base of the skull where the cerebellum, the small uh, lobe of the brain, sits. Um, as described by Dr. Poyman, there was a fracture, uh, a linear fracture, and then there was a, a nine millimeter by one millimeter rectangular fracture that extended to the foramen magnum. The foramen magnum is that opening in the base of the skull that the uh, brain stem and the spinal cord pass through. Uh, Dr. Poyman also indicated that one of the wound tracks uh, passed through the cerebellum, the left cerebellar hemisphere, and that there was a secondary track that went into the internal capsule. Uh, when he means the internal capsule, he's referring to um, the area around nuclei within the center of the brain. So if I understand what you're saying, um, the stab wound that we saw um, in uh, V13 and 14 uh, went through her skull, fractured part of her skull, and yes. into her brain. Yes. Then the portions you described there. Did it also break uh, off a piece of her skull? Uh, there was a portion of that fracture that, uh, that was loose within the skull, yes. And what, if anything, does that tell you about the force? Well, that portion of the, the floor of the skull is, is fairly thick. And it, it, uh, I can't quantify by a number, sure. but it's, uh, it requires a fair amount of force to be able to penetrate the skull uh, in that way and then to be able to break off a piece. That 
injury, the stab wound to the back of her head and into her brain, was that enough to cause her death? That would be enough to cause her death over time. Tell me what you mean by that, please. Um, the portions of the brain that were injured uh, wouldn't, in my opinion, wouldn't necessarily cause instant death. But unattended, an injury like that would uh, result in uh, the brain's reaction to injury, further hemorrhage, and probably swelling. The, all the constellation of those reactions to injury would ultimately cause death. It could result in unconsciousness, but immediate death, not so much. Okay. Um, now, was there an injury, though, that you did identify as you went through this review that did cause her death? Uh, yes. The, uh, the ligature marks and the compression of the neck and the asphyxia uh, with it would, would and can cause a, um, a, a death on a, at a much shorter time period. Okay, let's talk about State's Exhibit V15 then. What does the jury see in this photograph, please? What you're seeing are two um, brown ligature marks. I will describe them um, as soon as I find Dr. Does Dr. Poyman structure his reports differently than you? Yes, Dr. Uh, Poyman structures his reports entirely different than I do, and uh, there we go. He describes this as two groups of yellow-brown skin furrows across the anterior, the front aspect of the neck. The ligature marks consist of a horizontally oriented abrasion that varies in width uh, about a quarter to a half inch, and below that is a second horizontally uh, oriented abrasion. So the first is about here, and then the second seems to go across here with a slight gap. Is there any way for you to tell whether that was one loop or two? Um, no. It could be one loop that then was loosened, slipped upward, and then was tightened again, or it could be two loops. And was there any corresponding ligature mark, I have to use the right terminology now, to the back of her neck? No, there was not. And can you explain how that might happen? Um, that could happen when uh, the ligature is not wrapped around the neck, but is simply pulled across the front and the sides and then pulled directly backward. That can happen either with it being pulled directly backward, or it can happen with suspension where um, the individual is face down and the ligature is being pulled upward. Could things like um, Rachel's hair or if there was an object back there like clothing or pantyhose or something also impact that? Uh, yes, something soft uh, would prevent the ligature from making a distinctive mark. Okay. Moving on to State's Exhibit V16. This is, this is the left side of the neck. We can see a ligature mark here. We can see another one here. And then V17. Right side of the neck. Again, seeing the ligature marks lower and upper. Uh, both of them ending just below the angle mm -hmm. of the jaw on the right side. And are both of those just the sides, the continuation of what we saw on the front of her neck? Yes, they are. Okay. When you, uh, I'm sorry, when Dr. Poyman took a look at the structures of her neck underneath those marks, was there any underlying injury there? Uh, yes, there was. Can you explain that to the jury, please? Okay. Um, when a neck is compressed by any mechanism, if it's compressed severely, the muscles, we call them the strap muscles of the neck, uh, and the soft tissues can have bleeding within them. Uh, doctor, uh, I have to find his description. Dr. Poyman noted that 
there was, uh, on the right side of the neck, there was a small amount of hemorrhage at the insertion of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The sterno sternocleidomastoid muscle. You're going to have to spell that for me right there, yeah. The sternocleidomastoid muscle goes from the mastoid process under the ear, comes down at an angle, and it ties into the clavicle and the sternum. Uh, there is a portion where it ties into the clavicle and the sternum, and there was hemorrhage down at that lower portion of it on the right. On the left side, um, there was hemorrhage again in that same, um, uh, same muscle on the left side with more hemorrhage, again, at its lower portions. And in order for both the, the marks that we saw and for that hemorrhage, um, her heart would have had to have been beating, at yes. least initially. At least initially. What, if anything, um, do those marks um, or the underlying hemorrhaging tell you about force? Well, it tells me that there was uh, certainly sufficient force to compress the, um, to compress the blood vessels. It tells me there is sufficient force to cause small blood vessels in the muscles and the soft tissue to rupture and bleed. Um, hanging deaths or strangulation deaths or deaths due to neck compression by any mechanism often occur uh, due to the lack of blood to the flow to the brain. Uh, this can occur by squeezing the neck in some way uh, and obstructing the veins, draining the blood from the head, and it, it may take maybe five pounds of pressure at most to do that. Also, the carotid arteries, one on each side, which are sending blood to the brain, can be compressed uh, with, uh, it's generally accepted between five and 10 pounds of pressure. In either case, uh, there's a lack of blood flow to the brain, and in a few minutes, the brain uh, becomes anoxic and begins to die. So you mentioned a few minutes there. So in order for, um, without a specific number, it would take uh, minutes for someone to die via strangulation. Well, it, yes, it would, it would take minutes for them to suffer irreversible brain injury. Okay. And that would happen before, obviously, they then die. Yes. Okay. Thank you for correcting me. Now, is there any way for you to tell medically... If so, in that situation, we're talking about pressure on the neck for for that entire time, right? Minutes like that. Yes. Is there any way for you to tell medically if that pressure has been released and reapplied multiple times, or even just once? Uh, there are a couple indications. Um, pinpoint hemorrhages above the level of the ligature are noted to occur mostly with release of pressure, and then re reapplication of pressure. Um, with that, you can, you can see that uh, with application of pressure, blood flow might stop, and uh, pressure will, can build up in the small blood vessels. Pressure is released around the neck, blood flows again, it's reapplied, small blood vessels become engorged again. With that, with a couple cycles of that, uh, these small blood vessels um, in the skin uh, and, and, uh, and other uh, in, in the soft tissues uh, will rupture and cause bleeding. And um, can you also see evidence of that in, you said uh, pinpoint hemorrhages. Can you also see it inside the eyes? Yes, you can. Okay, evidence of that. Um, compression, release, compression, release. Yes. And did Rachel Anderson show signs of either of those? Uh, yes, she did. Okay, if we may. Um, we have States Exhibit V18. What are we looking at here, please? What we are looking at is a close-up of the left eye. Here's the eyebrow. Uh, this is the inside of the lower eyelid. Um, in the report, this is called the palpebral conjunctiva, and it is engorged with blood. It is hemorrhagic. Okay. Uh, what we also see are these little pinpoint hemorrhages. 
throughout this area, their term, medical term for that is petechial hemorrhages. They're pinpoint, uh, and in this case, are a result of small blood vessels breaking in the skin because of the pressure of blood flow being backed up by compression of the neck. Right, and then uh, moving on to V19. This is the upper outer portion of the left eye. You can see the conjunctiva on the surface of the eye is congested and that there is hemorrhage under the upper eyelid. Now you mentioned congested. What does that mean? The uh, blood vessels are overfilled with blood. Now can that happen? Is there a way to tell whether or not that was before or after her death? The congested part. The congested part. Um, someone face down can have some congestion of the conjunctiva, that, okay. that lining over the eye. Okay. I just want to make sure we're being clear. Right. But you also pointed to a darker area. Uh, of oh. hemorrhage. Sorry. Here. Yes. And that is similar to the area under the left, under the lower eyebrow, uh, eyelid. Is that area that's underneath that you just pointed to, underneath her top eyelid? Thank yes. you. And the part that was on the bottom. Yes. Are those different than congestion? Um, yes. And can you, um, I know you talked about the blood vessels bursting and things like that. Um, so would those other injuries, not the congestion, have been before she died? I would believe so, yes. Okay. And then on her other eye, do we see the same kind of evidence? Yes. It's less pronounced, but under the lower eyelid, we see similar uh, hemorrhages. Okay. And those hemorrhages, not the congestion, and the petechiae around her eye, um, are those consistent with what you previously explained for the jury of uh, the compression release, compression release. It would be consistent with a mechanism like that, yes. Okay. Um, are they consistent with uh, struggling? Yes. Dr. Daniels, was there also um, a toxicology screen completed? Uh, yes, one was completed. Is that done in every case? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Um, and were there any results of significance in her toxicology screen? Of significance, no. Okay. She had a, maybe a little bit of marijuana in her system. There was, and some marijuana metabolites, and an extremely low level of ethanol, that is drinking alcohol. Okay. Are either the level of um, marijuana or the metabolites or the alcohol anything that would have incapacitated her? No. Um, and when Dr. Poyman went through the rest of the examination of Ms. Anderson, did he identify any other kinds of conditions or naturally occurring medical illnesses that could have caused Rachel's death? No, he did not. Can you let this jury know, please, what did Dr. Poyman rule as the cause and manner of Rachel's death? Um, Dr. Poyman ruled cause of death to be stab wound of the head and neck and manner of death to be homicide. Now, I think you maybe flipped those a little bit. Can you tell me about that? Well, um, on the death certificate, there is also a section called Other Significant Conditions. Um, in, in toto, Dr. Poyman said, cause of death, stab wound of the head and neck, other significant condition, ligature strangulation, and manner of death, homicide. Uh, between pathologists, we often may disagree on small points. Um, if I had done this case, I might have reversed stab wound and ligature strangulation uh, in their positions, um, but they're both significant. Okay. Um, and then uh, what, was, what was the manner ruled then? The manner is ruled homicide. Okay. And then you had mentioned you might have flip-flopped, but ultimately um, those main findings, the stab wound and the ligature, um, were those findings consistent with your review of his? Oh, work? absolutely. And, and again, they're both significant findings. Okay. If I could have a moment, please. You may. <clears throat> uh, doctor, are all the opinions that you've given today to a reasonable degree of medical certainty? Yes, they are. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Roush. Cross-examination. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Daniels. 
Good afternoon. I want to direct your attention, I believe it's uh, State Exhibit V. Yes. And um, I'm turning to the second page, the third paragraph down. And I wanted you to describe the gentilia. Was there any damage noted in the autopsy at all? Uh, no, there was no damage noted. And that's on the exterior? Yes. Okay. What about the anus? Was there any damage to the anus at all? Um, there's, uh, the anus is mentioned and it, it is uh, without damage. Okay. And going to page five, I believe at the top of the page, uh, the uterus was examined. Well, just that whole top paragraph, what is that indicating? Well, it indicates um, that observation of the uterus, the endometrium, the muscle of the uterus, the myometrium, the fallopian tubes and the ovaries were uh, with outdoor abnormal lesion and appeared intact. Was the sexual assault kit done prior to the autopsy being performed? Or was it after? Can always, you tell? Always before by our usual uh, practice. Is that in Dr. Pullman? Was his, uh, that in his report? No, that is, that is the office's usual practice. Okay. Based on the report, what was the time of death? Well, the time of death that is recorded <clears throat> was, uh, well, date January 29th uh, at 1520 hours, which is 3.20 p.m. Thank you, Dr. Jones. I have nothing further. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Redirect. Thank you, Dr. Daniels, could you please explain how your office records the date and time of death. Okay. Time of death, as it is in these reports, is an administrative time of death. That is, that is the time when someone who can pronounce death, uh, such as first responders, physicians, nurses, actually views the body and determines that death has occurred. Um, some of you may remember when the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded uh, years ago uh, off the coast of Florida. All of us know that the individuals, the uh, unfortunate astronauts, died when that crashed into the ocean. But the official time of death on both of the, on all of them was not until a few weeks later when their bodies were brought ashore and the coroner of that area of Florida pronounced their, saw the bodies and pronounced death. So there is a difference between the administrative time of death and what we might call the actual time of death. Okay. Um, you were asked about um, any, if there was a, any sign of injury to um, Rachel's genitalia, uh, her vaginal area. Yes. Can you explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury how it's possible to have a sexual assault with no signs of injury? Yeah, please approach. Uh, Dr. Daniels, have you had an opportunity to conduct, in those other autopsies you've done, conduct autopsies where there is a suspicion of sexual assault? Yes. 
Do you know approximately how many of them? I can't really say. It's okay. Um, I think, how many autopsies have you conducted? Oh, f about 5,000. Okay. Out of those 5,000, do you have a, a ballpark? Oh, maybe a, a few dozen, 100, 150. Okay. Um, and in those, whether they're ones that you've done or that you've reviewed yourself, um, have there been some allegations of a sexual assault? Yes, there have. And when you've conducted those exams yourself, um, have you always found injuries? We'll talk about women. Have you always found injuries to the women's genitalia? Um, not always. Okay. And um, does that, based on your training and your experience, um, is, that po is that possible? Does that surprise you? No, it does not surprise me. Can you explain why? Okay. Soft tissues are just that, soft. Um, you know, there's, in a woman's pelvis, there are tissues that have a lot, can stretch uh, a great deal. Um, certainly in a sexual assault, injuries, mucosal tears, and so forth can occur. Uh, but they don't always have to occur. Um, that would depend upon the um, actual manner of assault what exactly happened, amount of force, and so forth. And obviously that varies from one case to another, and it's something I can't predict. But I can say that that is not seen, injuries are not seen in every case. Thank you, nothing further. Thank you, Ms. Rouse. Uh, recross. <clears throat> Doctor, just so I'm clear, um, you did not examine an individual in this case, did you? I did not. And your testimony is based on what's in this report, is that correct? On Dr. Poyman's observations, yes. And so any other explanation that you would give as to why there is no evidence in this report of a sexual assault is just your opinion. Is that correct? It's my opinion based on my experience, and that's it. Can you determine, sir, um, how long a person has been dead? I mean, based on, like, rigor mortis or food uh, digestion or something of that nature? Um, it can be done, depending on the postmortem interval. Uh, the closer uh, observations are made to the actual time of death, the more accurate can be. It can be, and as time passes, it becomes a range uh, of minutes or hours and becomes less accurate. So when you were given the example of the uh, rocket, we saw that. But in a case like this, when there's nobody seeing that, do, uh, as, do pathologists kind of estimate the time by other ways or manners, such as Rigor mortis. Uh, rigor mortis is variable, okay. depending on temperature and state of health. Uh, you know, we we don't typically put in our reports, for example, a, an estimated actual time of death based upon findings. Uh, we might, uh, if asked, we might look at the information and and say it's consistent with one, one thing or another. When you did the, well, not you, you didn't do it, but when Dr. Pullman did it, he did examine the contents of the stomach, is that correct? Yes, he did. And he was able to identify certain elements in the, that were left in terms of digestion in the yes, stomach, is that correct? Yes, he did. I'm not going to ask you about that now, but that's included in his report, is that not? Yes, it is. Okay. Does he talk about uh, rigor mortis at all in his report? He says that rigor mortis is absent. And what does that mean? <clears throat> well, that can mean one of two things, depending on other findings. One is either the Postmortem interval is very short, and I mean very short, such as 
less than a few hours, okay. or the postmortem interval is uh, greater than 24, 24 plus hours, depending on environment. Very short, possibly three hours or long. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Daniels. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Thomas. All right. Dr. Daniels? Okay, you can step down. You're not to discuss your testimony with anyone uh, while this case is still pending. No. Thank you. All right. Counsel, please approach. Excuse us again, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is all the evidence that you're going to hear today. We're going to release you. Uh, again, I need you here tomorrow morning um, before 9 o'clock. We'll get started as close to that time as we can. Uh, now, there is a chance, okay, there's a possibility um, that uh, we can get to the point tomorrow where deliberations can begin. No guarantee. This kind of depends on how things go. But because of the fact that there is a chance that we can get to that point, uh, you need to be prepared for sequestration. Um, so I think information was provided to each of you as to what's appropriate to bring, what's appropriate not to bring, uh, what it's going to, um, I guess, kind of look like uh, during that time. Uh, and I think the suggestion was just to be on the safe side, uh, pack enough for at least three days. Not saying that it would take that long, but uh, just a change of clothing if necessary. Uh, if we don't get to that point, unfortunately, uh, either you have to take your bags back home with you or we'll lock them up here. Uh, but if we do get to that point, uh, it's better, obviously, to be prepared uh, and, and ready for that. Uh, also, uh, I think plans have been made and we've already discussed with them uh, entering the courthouse tomorrow morning uh, and um, bailiff. Uh, Ms. Hall will be down there with the deputies uh, to help you move through that process of getting your stuff uh, inside the courtroom uh, as well. Uh, again, obviously, admonitions still apply. Uh, even though we're getting close, it would, be in, uh, would not be appropriate uh, for any of you to begin discussing the evidence, uh, giving your opinions, your thoughts uh, at this point in time. Uh, I will uh, indicate to you the importance of deliberation, uh, and deliberation can only occur when all 12 jurors are back in the jury room at the same time. Uh, so even uh, a couple of you at this point in time having, well, even after deliberations begin, a couple of you having conversations outside the hearing of the others would be inappropriate. Uh, so once again, uh, please have a safe trip home tonight, a safe trip back tomorrow. Uh, meet you here uh, as close to 9 as possible. We'll try to get started as close to that time uh, as we can. Uh, if you have any questions uh, still remaining, uh, please let Ms. Harper know. Uh, if she cannot address that, that question, she'll get with me, and then hopefully I'll have an answer for you. All right. Any questions uh, at this point in time? All right. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. All rise for the jury. All right, you may be seated, everyone. Okay. okay. Do we have... Uh, an updated uh, version of the, the jury instructions? Because we do not, Your Honor. Um, the um, changes, or I should say corrections, that I talked to them about were all accepted. They were all basically, um, I would say, grammatical um, type of corrections. Um, there was... Um, Some 
additional things that were given to me today that I haven't had a chance to talk to them about. Okay. But I, can, I will certainly do that and we can have it ready for tomorrow. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. I just told the jurors to come, to be prepared to, to get started around 10. Because um, either way, there's going to be several issues that we're going to need to iron out. Uh, but I'd like to get as many of those out of the way this evening, uh, if we can. Um, so if someone could provide me a draft uh, of the jury instructions with what has been agreed, uh, please do that. We'll try to sit and do that before we leave. The, the changes that Isabella made her relatively um, easy to do, and we'll just have them double check the additions Mr. O'Brien sent, and hopefully we'll have a, a copy to send to you, Judge. No, I, I can, Isabella, if you give me your changes, and then what you had yesterday, you oh, uh, I will okay. put, put a message for no, Dr. Guy here. We have, so we have any, or any other copy of what we've done? Okay, so we can add these to it, okay. and then we can print everybody a copy of I, I have a very, very rough draft of uh, verdict forms that I've not had a chance to even review. I don't mind making a copy uh, for you to take with you tonight. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure you get a copy of these uh, so that you can review those overnight and make whatever changes you wish to the verdict forms. Yes? Do you want us to work to go through exhibits with you now? I'd prefer doing exhibits now if we could. Um, we're prepared to do that, Your Honor. However, before we officially close our case, um, we do have what's been marked for identification as case exhibit D. Which I believe that is going to be a stipulation to the document as well as the identification of Anthony J. Chardon being the same defendant in this case. Um, it is a certified copy of his judgment entry convicting him of attempted murder, aggravated robbery, and rape. Um, we had talked about this with the defense counsel, and just so the record is clear, this will apply to specification one to count one. Specification six to count one, specification one to count two, specification one and six to count three, specification one to count four, specification one and six to count five, specification one and two to count six, specification one and six to count seven. Specification 1 to count 8, and Specifications 1 and 6 to count 9, which had all been waived to the court, if I, if I listed those correctly. Okay. Well, I think either waived by statute or by the waiver form. However, the O statute would be waived for certain statute. And, Correct. Uh, uh, he waived the sexually violent uh, offender stack uh, uh, in the jury waiver. Uh, on behalf of Mr. Pardon, uh, with respect to State's Exhibit D, D. Sure, that may be a stipulated to this Correct. Uh, exhibit. D, we think that this is accurate in terms of uh, Anthony Pardon's history. And his identity for purposes of this. And story. identity, Your Honor. All right, if I could get DD, please. Yes. 
This is just for my just for my consideration only. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. And so that you're aware, we did mark the stipulations as Joint Exhibit One. Okay. 